That was something like what Beowulf may have sounded like. Uh, the performer there was Benjamin Bagby, performing on the type of harp that would have accompanied uh, the original singing or performance of the poem of Beowulf. And just like everything else we've read in here, uh, almost everything else, uh, this would have had uh, a history of, of oral production before it was ever written down in the manuscript we have today. The manuscript of Beowulf that we have comes from around the year 1000 of the Common Era, and uh, it's the only one we have. It's a really unique document because not only is this the only uh, written record we have of this story of Beowulf, it's also uh, the only type of, of, of epic poem like this we have in Old English literature. Now we have uh, things that sound similar to this written in prose from Iceland and other Old Norse uh, literature. Uh, of course we have you know, Latin literature from the Middle Ages that carried on traditions of the Aeneid from the ancient Romans. But as far as a, an Old English uh, a poem, a uh, heroic poem, uh, something like an epic, this is the only thing anywhere like what, uh, what Beowulf is in, in all of Old English literature. And this document barely survived. It was preserved in a book with uh, a few other texts. And that book itself was unrecognized by anyone for centuries. Uh, it sat in a, you know, one library or another until the 1700s when it was discovered uh, that it had something like an epic, like an English epic. And even after that was discovered, it didn't get translated into modern English. Uh, this is English, it's, it's old English, uh, but it sounds like another language. It's mostly a Germanic language. It doesn't have uh, even the, the early French and Latin words that we're used to being part of modern English. But nobody could read it, and then finally when somebody could read it, it still didn't get published for a while. And that one document that had, uh, the one book, the one codex that had uh, Beowulf uh, recorded on it, almost burned. The library that it was uh, kept in in the 1700s uh, burned, and you can still see the, the damage around the edges uh, that, uh, that that document suffered. But after all of that, it's even surprising that Beowulf was ever even written down. Uh, the fact is that it's an English poem. It's written by people who spoke English. They were Anglo-Saxons in England around the year 1000. But it's not about English ancestors. It's about a Gitish hero, or Yetish, uh, uh, Beowulf, who's fighting on behalf of the Danes living in Denmark in the 500s. Uh, so 500 years before this document is, is recorded. And it's written down by Christian Anglo-Saxons at a time when th the Christian Anglo-Saxons of England were at war with pagan Danes, uh, you know, polytheistic uh, Danes who were raiding the, the coast of England. Uh, there were also polytheistic Danes who lived in what is today the, the nation of, of England in the, the Dane law, this uh, area of England that had been uh, taken over by people of Danish descent, and a lot of them were still polytheistic, and there was a lot of hostility. Uh, I, I mentioned in another lecture the St. Bryce's Day Massacre uh, would, would happen ar around the, the time this uh, manuscript was written, where these polytheistic Danes were uh, uh, taking cover from a, a lynch mob, basically, of, of Anglo-Saxon Christians, and they took cover inside a Christian church, and rather than granting them sanctuary, the, uh, the Anglo-Saxons locked the door, bolted the door, and then burned everyone alive inside, burned the entire church down so that they could kill these, uh, these pagan Danes. So there was a lot of hostility between these two groups, and yet this document records a story about, that, that portrays the Danes favorably, uh, and particular uh, pagan Danes, even though there's this ambiguity that I'll, I'll talk about more about in a minute, as to 
how the, the Danes and the Geats like Beowulf uh, recognize the Christian God or do not recognize the Christian God. So the manuscript, the book, is written around the year 1000. It describes events that happened uh, in the 500s. Uh, the poem itself is probably much older than the book, but it certainly doesn't go all the way back to the time it describes. And the scholarly consensus is that it was probably composed in the 700s, uh, the 8th century, but it probably went through a lot of changes before it actually got written down. Uh, whether or not there were previous written versions of this that didn't survive, we don't know. But the language seems to tell us that it came from around the, you know, in, in the 700s. Uh, it's describing things happening in the 500s. It's not written down until around the year 1000. We can tell the, the date of its writing based on the, uh, the, the writing style itself, the, the handwriting. And despite barely surviving, despite barely coming down to us uh, today, this poem has become very influential on a lot of uh, uh, modern culture, especially our conception of the Middle Ages. Uh, that is a, a good thing, and it's kind of a problematic thing. It's kind of difficult for modern readers to go back and read this poem without all of the cultural baggage, all the modern schemata uh, that we're familiar with, that we think is part of this literature, without projecting all of that back into a poem in which it doesn't really belong. And it's not, uh, this problem isn't made any easier by the fact that a lot of things aren't described. The uh, author of the poem, the poet, uh, seems to assume we know what he means by uh, references to uh, different individuals from history uh, and that sort of thing that we have nothing to, uh, to, to really use to fill in other than our modern context, our personal context. Uh, this is uh, nowhere more uh, obvious than with the, the creature Grendel. We don't know what Grendel is. We don't know what he looks like. We're told that he has sharp teeth and that he has glowing eyes. But beyond that, we have to sort of imagine what he looks like. Uh, the, the poet doesn't tell us. And of course, every film version that we've seen, every comic book version, uh, has to come up with a way to portray Grendel. Is he this giant zombie looking thing? Is he this giant shaggy like ogre? Uh, is he this, uh, the, the most recent uh, version, uh, TV version, Beowulf Return to the Shieldlands, kind of has him looking like a giant golem from Lord of the Rings. But none of these are wrong because we don't know what the right version is. Uh, and the same goes for a lot of other elements there. So it's kind of hard for us to distance ourselves from our personal context. It may be that personal context that makes us interested in this sort of thing uh, to, to start with. I have to confess that that was the case with me. I grew up in the 80s and 90s playing a lot of uh, fantasy video games like Legend of Zelda and Wizards and Warriors. And uh, when it came time to decide what kind of literature I wanted to uh, uh, invest in, spend time reading and that sort of thing, I felt, well, it seems like Beowulf sort of most closely resembles my interest. And I, you know, it took me a long time to realize how much I was projecting into the poem that wasn't actually there. But remember that problem uh, or that uh, psychological experiment I mentioned in the past where uh, someone reads you uh, a, a list of uh, words that all seem to have something to do with uh, sewing or something we associate with the word needle, but the word needle is not in it. And then when asked later, uh, did you hear the word needle in that uh, list of words? Most people say yes, but actually it, we heard all these things that uh, cohered with the word needle, but we didn't hear the, hear the word needle itself. Um, we call that associative coherence. So we associate all of these different things from uh, fantasy movies, fantasy video games, um, and fantasy novels. Uh, we associate that with the Middle Ages, but we have to be careful that uh, we don't project too much into this text that's not already there, that's not actually there. But every text leaves a, uh, a lot of gaps for the reader to fill. And if we're reading for enjoyment, then that's totally fine. We can, you know, uh, fill in the, the, the images, uh, the assumptions that we're used to. But as scholars in, in this class, we want to uh, be very careful about what we read and make sure that we're not adding anything that uh, isn't there in the text itself. So that means we have to learn something about the historical context. We have to know something about the, the world being described in this uh, poem. To be fair, one of the reasons that we uh, have these, uh, these connections between medieval sort of fantasy uh, creatures and terms and, and ideas uh, and, and medieval literature is because of uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, 
Uh, J.R. Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings was very influential on uh, during the, the 70s and 80s, the, the fantasy genre, uh, you know, games like Dungeons and Dragons that uh, were paper-based games that then became developed into the video games, uh, novels that, uh, that followed after him. Uh, and Tolkien was a, uh, a scholar, a, a scholar specifically of Old English, uh, the language that the poem of Beowulf was written in, and he has written extensively on uh, Beowulf. Uh, he, uh, most recently, a uh, translation that he made of the poem of Beowulf has come out, a translation into modern English that his son uh, Christopher Tolkien edited the way uh, Christopher Tolkien has edited a lot of his uh, father's works that were, were never published during his lifetime. But actually more importantly is an essay which uh, started out as a, uh, an academic lecture that he gave uh, for other academics, uh, which he called Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics. And this, uh, this lecture that was later published is one of the earliest and most influential um, uh, academic works on the poem of Beowulf because it really made people take Beowulf seriously as a work of literature. And, and told them to you know not just use it to sort of mine uh, this information about ancient uh, or medieval history, but to actually look at it as literature for its own sake, uh, not as a sort of uh, a clue to uh, the different Germanic tribes that were around during the, uh, the early Middle Ages, but uh, something that was written in order to be enjoyed as a work of literature. And of course, a lot of uh, Tolkien studies in uh, Old Norse literature, Old English literature, uh, and, and other uh, medieval literature made its way into Lord of the Rings. And then from Lord of the Rings, it was then adopted by other fantasy writing. Things like uh, Beorn the bear in The Hobbit, uh, you may recognize uh, as this sort of uh, bear figure very similar to Bodvar Bjarki. Now, we don't see Bodvar Bjarki actually change into a bear, but he has control of this bear while there's this, this final battle between Rolf Kraki's men and uh, Queen Skuld's army. So there's this connection between Bodvar and the bear. Of course, his father was named Bjorn, uh, spelled a little bit differently than Tolkien's character, but uh, Bjorn actually does turn into a bear by day. Uh, and of course, we've got the dragon Smaug that sits on this hoard of gold. This is a very common uh, theme in, in Old English, but you know, it's one of many different uh, themes about dragons, but uh, it becomes really uh, well known to us today because of, of Tolkien uh, serving as that bridge. Other things that are less obvious are uh, Tolkien's use of the word orc. Now, orcs are, you know, show up in all sorts of games like World of Warcraft and, and, and that sort of thing, but the word never really was used before it was used for uh, the orcs in the Lord of the Rings novels. And that word seems to come from this line in Beowulf. It's uh, lines 98 to 101. Uh, if you're using the uh, Longman Cultural Edition of Beowulf, uh, the line numbers are a little problematic because they don't quite match um, most of the standard line numbers. But if you have the, uh, uh, the Sarah Anderson edition, the Longman version, uh, if you look at line 99 to 101, you'll see that uh, there's this uh, line that says, from that horrible progeny from Cain, these are the descendants of the biblical Cain, from that horrible progeny all awoke the Jotuns, or Jotuns, these giants, uh, and elves, and orcs, and also giants, another kind of giant. Um, uh, the Jotuns are the Old Norse version of frost giants, and then we have the Gigantus in Old English, which seems to be borrowed from the, the Latin, uh, referring to giants. But all these are creatures that strove with God for a long time. Well, that word Orkneos, we have no idea how to translate that. It doesn't uh, really correspond to anything that we know of uh, before this time. But of course, once Tolkien takes that word and turns it into the orcs of the Uruk-hai in the, the Lord of the Rings novels, then we sort of assume we know what that means. But before Tolkien sort of created this creature, uh, no one really knew how to translate that word, Orkneos. Now, the, you recognize the word Ilfa there uh, is the origin of the word elves. Uh, Aeltons is, uh, corresponds to the, the Old Norse Jotuns, uh, which are the, the frost giants that are enemies of the gods. Uh, but actually, Aelton is where uh, Tolkien got the word for the Ents, these giant tree people. But of course, what Tolkien is doing with this is a creative reinterpretation. Uh, Tolkien has written a lot of scholarship on Beowulf and other uh, medieval literature, but when we access these things through Lord of the Rings, we're actually taking his 20th century adaptation, uh, 
which may have some correspondence, but we don't want to then take that 20th century adaptation and project it back into the past, back into the original text. We have to come across this reference to Oryx and just sort of wonder, well, what, what is this? Rather than having a, an assumption that our modern schemata fits that. So just like Hroth's saga, uh, Beowulf looks back across 500 years, uh, looks from the high Middle Ages back into the time of the Great Migrations. Uh, at the time, uh, right about the same time the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes were uh, invading uh, the island of Britain. Uh, we have the writing coming uh, after probably a couple of centuries of oral tradition, and that oral tradition coming probably after a couple of centuries of uh, just sort of legend. Uh, uh, and keep in mind when I say oral tradition, I'm talking about the composed poem. Uh, you know, every line being remembered more or less as it was heard by uh, the, the bard or the shop, uh, someone who would have sung it the way Benjamin Bagby uh, sang it at the beginning of uh, this presentation. Uh, it would have had a certain coherence, a certain fidelity across uh, decades, maybe even centuries uh, in oral tradition. But before the oral tradition, it would have been just you know a story somebody remembered their grandfather or their grandfather's grandfather telling. So the time that Beowulf is looking back to, Beowulf the poem is looking back to, is around the same time or shortly after uh, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes come from the Jutland Peninsula. This is what we call the modern nation of Denmark, or at least this particular peninsula. As the Romans are retreating from Britain, they're going back to Rome to help defend Rome against the invading Visigoths around the year 410 and shortly after that. And when they do, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes start to invade uh, uh, Britain. So this is the beginning of this connection between the Anglo-Saxons of the time the Beowulf manuscript was written around the year 1000 and the people in this in the Jutland area of Northern Europe. And about this same time, shortly after this, around the year 520, according to the uh, Frankish author uh, Gregory of Tours, we have a, someone who's referred to as a yeet or a geet or a got or goth uh, named uh, Kohilakis or Hokilakis. Uh, this is someone who corresponds to the figure of Hygelac in Beowulf. And because Gregory's tour, uh, Gregory of Tours is writing a uh, historical account, this seems to be somebody who actually existed. Uh, and in particular, Gregory of Tours is writing about the history of the Franks, but as part of the history of the Franks, he's talking about these battles that the ancient Franks have won. Uh, remember, the, the Frankish kingdom is uh, what will, uh, a few centuries after this time, be uh, the kingdom of Charlemagne. Uh, but the, the Franks go to Frisia in order to fight on behalf of the Frisians against this invading or raiding army, uh, this army of Geats that's coming from Geatland. So we can pinpoint the year of this raid is around the year 520, some say 521. And we know from Beowulf, uh, from lines 1059 to 69, that uh, Hygelac, when he was king of the Geats, uh, actually raids Frisia, uh, just like in uh, Gregory of Tours' account. And he's defeated by the Franks and he's killed. Uh, Beowulf is the only survivor of this battle. And it's after this that Beowulf goes back to Geatland. He doesn't become king yet, but after Hygelac's sons are dead, then Beowulf becomes king. But uh, this correspondence at least helps us pinpoint something like a, a historical time period. Just like with uh, the Iliad, we might have uh, these other stories referring to characters or historical figures that lived uh, centuries apart uh, that have just been sort of combined into one time period. And so we might not be able to really pinpoint uh, uh, everything in Beowulf into the, around the year 520, but we can at least say that this character corresponds to this time. We know also, though, that there, uh, according to the archaeological evidence, there was a great hall in Denmark at, uh, on the island of Zeeland uh, between the, the Jutland Peninsula and the Swedish Peninsula at uh, the location of Lyra, uh, L-E-J-R-E. -E. And that seems to correspond to Heorot in Beowulf or Hlidar in Hrolf Kraki's saga. There was this great hall that was sort of maybe the wealthiest and richest and most famous uh, in this area at this time. And we do have archeological evidence that around the time of uh, Hygelac, around the year uh, 520, uh, there does se seem to have been a, a great hall at this location that would correspond to uh, Heorot or Halidar. So all of this is toward the end of the era of the Great Migrations. After the Angles and Saxons uh, invade uh, uh, the island of Britain, 
Uh, they're converted to Christianity uh, starting around the year uh, 600. So the English uh, are sort of, of, have become a different identity group than the Angles from whom they took their name. Uh, they're Christians, they live on an island, they have a, a connection to Rome and to the Holy Roman Empire that uh, people living in uh, the area of the Saxons and, uh, and, and up into to Scandinavia don't have uh, the same sort of connection to the, the larger Christian Europe. Uh, but they're the ones that start invading during the Viking Age, uh, starting with the raid at Lindisfarne in around the year 793. And um, starting with the year 865, we have uh, a large number of uh, people from somewhere in Scandinavia uh, uh, attacking uh, the, the coast of Britain and actually moving in and taking over the city of York in Northern England. And this is usually referred to as the Great Heathen Army. These are the, the guys that call themselves the sons of Ragnar Lodbrok. Now, whether or not they were actual genetic sons, we don't know. But uh, they, uh, there were so many people coming from uh, Scandinavia, and they were all being referred to as Danes, even though they probably weren't all from uh, Denmark. Uh, they were referred to as Danes. They start settling. They start making so much uh, headway. Their army starts pushing the, the English uh, powers back. They, they defeat the, the kingdoms of, of Mercia and uh, in East Anglia and uh, uh, Northumbria. And they're basically able to set up their own little country within the island of Britain. And they're able to maintain rule over that until around the year 937 when there's a famous battle of uh, Brunaber when the English sort of retake the Dane law. Uh, there continues to be uh, Norwegian kings that come and rule over uh, from York like uh, Eric Bloodaxe, but he's defeated and killed in, in 954. So after that, the English have sort of retaken the island, but we still have this population of quote unquote Danes, these people that are, uh, some of them are probably Christian, but a lot of them are probably polytheistic. Uh, some of them uh, are Anglo-Saxon or of Anglo-Saxon descent, but a lot of them are of uh, Norwegian, Norse, uh, Swedish, uh, Giedish maybe, uh, and Danish descent. And that means we have a, another sort of a Scandinavian culture uh, coming and overlapping this uh, older uh, Anglo-Saxon culture and uh, a non-Christian culture overlapping or uh, contending with uh, a Christian culture. So this is the world, this is the, the political, social, sort of uh, ethnic identity world that Beowulf is emerging in. Uh, it's emerging in uh, an area ruled by Christians, but sort of threatened or permeated by uh, non-Christians. It's ruled over by Anglo-Saxons who speak Old English, but it's sort of threatened by these Danes on the periphery. And so we might imagine that Beowulf f was very interesting to people of this mixed heritage. Uh, and people who had interest, both you know, a Christian audience and a, a polytheistic audience, or a sort of you know in-between audience, uh, is probably interested to people of Anglo-Saxon descent whose ancestors have been there for several centuries, and also interesting to people of Danish or Norse descent who'd only been there a generation or two. So it's the kind of thing you could imagine being very popular among the common people. What's interesting is somebody wrote it down. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is a very unique manuscript because there, there's nothing else like this written uh, from this time in English history. And writing isn't as simple as it might seem at first. There's no paper at this time. Uh, for one thing, most people are illiterate. The people who are the most literate are going to be the clergy. Uh, the people, not just the people who are uh, Christian, but the people who have dedicated their entire lives to becoming uh, monks, to uh, taking a vow of celibacy and you know, distinct uh, setting themselves apart from the, uh, the the common people. And they're the ones who know how to write, they're the ones who know how to read, and they have access to the resources that you need to actually do this writing. And there's no paper at this time, so if you want to write something down, you have to, for every single page, you have to kill a calf or a sheep, and you have to stretch that calf or that sheep's skin out in this long, sort of arduous process of, uh, uh, sort of stretching it and then smoothing it down uh, over a long period of time until it's uh, smooth enough to, to write on. Uh, you can imagine this is uh, an expensive process and most people don't have the resources to do this sort of thing. Uh, the church has the resources to do this sort of thing, but if you read uh, Alcuin's uh, letter uh, about asking the question, you know, what has Ingeld to do with Christ? Why are these uh, these clergymen wasting their time listening to stories about people like Ingeld, who we now know from Beowulf, 
uh, when this is not their duty? Why should they be wasting their time? Uh, you can imagine what he would say uh, knowing that they were wasting resources, uh, church resources, uh, every page of Beowulf, uh, and you see how large the writing here, although the, the book itself, it's, it's still preserved today in the, the Cotton Vitellius manuscript that I mentioned uh, uh, at the beginning. Uh, it's really small, it's not much bigger than the book that you were actually reading it from, but it's still a lot of pages and it still takes a long time to produce. So the fact that these resources are being used to tell a story about a pagan people at a pagan time and who are Danes, I mean, most of them nonetheless, but you know, besides Beowulf, uh, the, the very people that England is at war with and still considers themselves at war with, uh, the fact that these resources and this labor is being dedicated to telling this secular story about these foreign people uh, is, uh, tells us that this is a very, uh, this document it, it almost didn't make it. It, it, had, it would have had to justify itself in religious terms as well as in terms of cultural uh, uh, identity and, or entertainment or something like that. So that is probably why we can see a certain element of syncretism. Uh, remember that syncretism is combining elements from two different worldviews, especially religious or, or cultural schemata, from, from two different groups that, that wouldn't normally uh, interact, that wouldn't normally uh, tell the same story. And you see a lot of things in Beowulf, like the creation account uh, from lines 84 to 90. And again, I should mention that if you're using the uh, Longman Cultural Edition of Beowulf, these line numbers correspond to this book. They do not correspond to the standard line numbers in most uh, translations of Beowulf. So sometimes you'll have to, to look, usually it's uh, between 100 and 200 lines uh, ahead. These, uh, these lines will be, uh, you'll have to add, you know, start, look 10, 20, 30 lines ahead. Uh, if you're using a, a different translation, and you should be able to find the, the thing I'm describing. But there's a creation account that sounds very much like the Genesis account. There's direct reference to Cain. Now, uh, of course, Cain is you know uh, the the figure from the, the book of Genesis, uh, but you uh, something's been added. That is, there's this belief by the time that Beowulf has been written that uh, Cain had descendants. These descendants weren't all killed off in the flood. Uh, some of them survived and they survive as monsters like uh, what I mentioned before, the orcs, the, the elves, the, uh, the giants. These were all descendants of Cain and this is what uh, Grendel is. Grendel and his mother are described as descendants of Cain and because they descended from Cain they inherit his sin which is uh, that he killed his brother, uh, killed his brother Abel and that sort of left a mark on uh, all his descendants. There is what's frequently described as the Christian excursus. That is a sort of uh, an addition or a, so, uh, an aside where uh, at this time after the, the narrator tells us that after Grendel uh, starts attacking Heorot that the Danes go to worship devils in order to get rid of Grendel. Uh, that they remembered hell. This was their heathen hope. Uh, this is a sort of odd digression because it's it's something where the, the narrator is stopping to condemn something that the characters are doing. And he doesn't usually do that. He doesn't do that very often. Uh, an interesting thing about uh, these lines is they don't match the uh, sort of the meter or the, they don't use this, the usual sort of vocabulary that the rest of the poem does. And this has led uh, people, uh, including J.R.R. Tolkien, to speculate that this uh, uh, these lines that sort of seem like this uh, uh, interjection of this sermon in the middle of a, of a narrative, uh, that this is an interpolation, that is something that's been added later because uh, at this point in the narrative, you have this uh, demon, this you know monster, Grendel, shows up, kills people, and then you have people praying to idols, to you know, presumably the polytheistic gods, and then just a few lines after that, Beowulf gets the message and shows up and comes to kill Grendel. Now, it's very possible that there was a, a past version where these prayers go, you know, directly to, uh, you know, some other god, and that other god is the one that sends uh, Beowulf. But uh, for whatever reason, there are these lines that seem to have been added in that are sort of there to remind the Christian Anglo-Saxon that, uh, you know, paganism is devil worship. Just, you know, th they did this back then. They were, they had this heathen hope. Uh, they trusted their souls to hell, uh, so don't be like them, but now let's continue with the story. That's an interpolation, that's sort of adding something that may or may not really fit, but uh, you add it for, uh, to make it fit the, the later culture, the culture of the year 1000 
in, uh, in Anglo-Saxon, Christian Anglo-Saxon England. Uh, other familiar elements from a biblical worldview, a Christian worldview, would be the flood. Uh, after Beowulf uh, kills both Grendel and Grendel's mother, uh, he brings back the sword that he used to kill Grendel's mother, and of course the, the blade has melted away uh, where he, he cut into her blood, but he's still got the hilt, and he brings that hilt by and it, back, and it's got uh, these uh, inscriptions on it. He brings it and he gives it to Hrothgar. Hrothgar looks at it and then he starts to describe a time of uh, before a flood, when, when God sent this flood to kill the giants. Now, uh, the uh, flood narrative in Genesis, you know very well by now. We've read uh, three different flood narratives, uh, Genesis being the, the latest one. And in Genesis, it's not a race of giants that's being killed by the flood. It's uh, all the, uh, the humans that have been wicked, that have turned against God, and it's only Noah and his, uh, his family that, uh, that are uh, saved from that flood. But there is, we know from Old Norse texts from, from Iceland, that uh, there was a story about the god Odin and his two brothers uh, killing the race of giants that uh, lived in the, the beginning of the world uh, by uh, killing this, uh, the, the father of all the giants, Ymir. Uh, and from Ymir's you know, gigantic carcass, they uh, use his body to build the, the world that we live in. Uh, but when um, they cut open his body, his, uh, the blood that flows out of his body creates this flood and it kills all his descendants, the giants, except one who is able to build a boat. One giant uh, is, is able to build a boat and, and survive. And so that's, you know, he's the one who gives birth to the, the, the giants that live after that flood. So it's very clear that the, the Beowulf poet is referring uh, consciously to Genesis, but it's also one of those elements that may or may not have its roots in a Germanic uh, pre-Christian narrative and uh, be one that sort of uh, merged with uh, the Christian, the Genesis flood. Uh, either way, it's, it's, we've gone one more step in our, uh, our flood narrative from Atrahasis to Gilgamesh to, to Genesis, and now uh, we've got one more flood in Beowulf. Uh, after he uh, reads about this flood on this, the hilt of the sword, uh, what follows is Hrothgar's sermon. It's frequently called the sermon because it's, he's telling Beowulf to remain humble. Uh, and he tells him about this king named Haramod who was not humble and he was a terrible person. And then he, he talks in the abstract about how sin invades the mind. And so the mind has like this guardian that sits, you know, to sort of uh, keep sin out of it. But then the guardian goes to sleep and that's when sin is able to sneak in. Like sin is this attacking uh, enemy, is able to sneak into the mind and, and corrupt the, the soul. Uh, Beowulf himself refers to God uh, a lot when he says that you know God will decide the outcome. He says he's not going to use weapons against Grendel. Uh, he's just going to go in and fight, and then God will decide um, uh, who's going to win. But he also refers to fate in the same way. He uses the word uh, weird, uh, W-Y-R-D, very often. So Beowulf shows deference to God. He gives thanks to God in a sort of a general uh, sort of way, especially when it comes time for him to brag, for him to say, here's this great thing I've done. He, he conspicuously doesn't brag. He doesn't try to focus on himself. He just says, uh, you know, God allowed me to, uh, to, to accomplish this feat uh, or something like that. We have a lot of uh, phrases that are referred to as so shall statements. Uh, these are sort of proverbs that are uh, sort of moral instruction about how uh, uh, someone should act, uh, what, what we should do in, in certain situations. Uh, so, for instance, in line th uh, 1358, uh, we're told of Beowulf that he would trust in the strength of his mighty hand grip, so shall a man, unmindful of life, win lasting renown. Uh, and you know, frequently this is, uh, you know, here's how a, a person should be. Uh, Shield Sheafing, in the beginning of the poem, has a son named Beo, and uh, uh, in the, the manuscript it's actually written Beowulf, but to, to avoid confusing, uh, most translations just translate his, his name as Beo. But uh, he's described as, as acting a certain way, and we're told, so shall a prince do if he hopes to win uh, thanes, retainers, people that will, will follow him in battle. Um, there are so shall statements for women as well, uh, like uh, the description of Queen Heed, uh, whose name means like mind uh, around line 1717 where it said, you know, you know, so shall a, a woman do in order to weave peace uh, among her, her kin. So these, this sort of moral instruction is something we may expect to see uh, in a, uh, a sort of a Christian sermon or a Christian moral teaching of the time. And so there's quite a few of these that 
where the narrator sort of stops just telling the story just long enough to say, see what that guy did, that's what you should do. We also have this sort of meditation on impermanence in what's frequently called an ubi sunt uh, uh, passage. Now, the so shall statement is, uh, in the Old English is uh, so shall, that uh, uh, S-C-E-A-L, uh, that's uh, the way it's written in Old English. Ubi sunt is actually Latin, but because this is a, a common motif in uh, certain poetry that's written in Latin, uh, it's, it's referred to that even when it's in Old English. And it just means where are. In other words, where are these things that used to exist that are no longer around? All these uh, things that we celebrate in our world that are now decaying. So in the poem, The Wanderer, uh, the, uh, the Wanderer uh, asks, when he looks at this uh, crumbling wall, you know, he says this, this work of giants stands withered and still, and he knows these you know, men lie buried underneath it because it was the, the location of these ancient battles that you know, no matter who won and who lost that battle, um, you know, they're all dead now, where are they all gone? And so he asks, where is the war steed? Where is the warrior? Where is his warlord? Where are now the feasting places? Where are now the mead hall pleasures? Alas, bright cup, alas, brave knight, alas, you glorious princes, all gone, lost in the night, uh, as if you had never lived. And all that survives you are these serpentine walls, wondrously high, worked in strange ways. Mighty spears have slain these men, greedy weapons have framed their fate. Uh, so he's asking, where now are these glories of the past that leave only ruins? We have that same sort of ubi sunt lament in Beowulf, uh, starting around line uh, 1969 in the uh, Longman Cultural Edition. You know, many of these uh, goblets had gone to the earth house, had gone into the ground, uh, you know, been buried. Legacies left by lordly people in an age uh, someone unknown had cleverly covered these costly treasures. Hold now, earth, what men may not, the hoard of these heroes, the earth-gotten wealth, uh, when it first was won. A war death has felled them, an evil befalling uh, each of my people. Gone are the brethren who br uh, brave many battles. From the hard helmet, this hand-wrought gilding drops into dust. Uh, asleep are the smiths who knew how to burnish the war chief's mask, or mend the mail shirts, mangled in battle. Shields and mail shirts molder with warriors and uh, follow no foes to faraway fields. No harp rejoices to herald the heroes. No hand-fed hawk swoops through the hall. No stallion stamps in the stronghold's courtyard. Uh, death has undone many kindreds of men. So this recognition of the impermanence uh, of this world and everything we can achieve in this world is something that fit very well with uh, the Christian emphasis on the next world, uh, with uh, you know say, storing up treasures in heaven uh, rather than treasures on the earth. Uh, so this this much fits with this. Uh, drive to sort of syncretize, the, the syncretism between the Christian and the, the ancient Germanic polytheistic worldview. And it's quite likely that this sort of syncretism, this sort of emphasis on the parts that fit the Christian worldview and de-emphasis on the parts that do not fit the Christian worldview, this is probably what uh, convinced the, the people who actually did write this down on this expensive parchment, uh, convinced them that this is something that uh, can fit into uh, our qu Christian mission. Uh, whichever monk or groups of monks uh, at whichever monastery or church or wherever uh, wrote this down, could, it, could justify this as something that had something of a Christian lesson in it. But that doesn't mean that this is a perfect fit. There are still references to uh, elements of the polytheistic worldview. Now there's no reference to any uh, gods other than the Christian God. Uh, oddly, you may have noticed there's no reference to Jesus or anything else, specifically Christian. Uh, the only name from the Bible we're given is Cain. So there's a reference to Cain and then there's reference to God and the reference to God are usually words like uh, uh, method, which means the weaver, someone who weaves the, the fates of the world, who, who, who orchestrates uh, the, the, the way things are going to happen. And in that regard, he's very similar to this uh, old Germanic, Anglo-Saxon, as well as Norse idea of weird. This is where we get the word weird, W-E-I-R-D, uh, means something is odd, I wouldn't have expected this. But that actually comes from a word for fate. Uh, and it was a goddess. In Old Norse, it's Urd, U-R-D. Uh, Urd uh, is one of the Norns, one of the, the women who weaves the fate of, of mortals, but also of, of the gods. In Anglo-Saxon, Old English, it's weird, W-Y-R-D. And this word actually shows up in the Old English in Beowulf. For example, uh, lines 508 to 510, uh, 404, uh, 2715. Just like Beowulf sort of defers credit for the things he does, like defeating Grendel and his mother, he defers that credit to God in some passages. He also defers credit to weird. He'll say that, you know, weird goes as it must. Uh, I'm going to, you know, 
uh, fight these these monsters, but uh, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know if I'll win. Uh, weird will go as it must. Uh, fate will go as it must. Uh, so uh, a lot of uh, ink has been spilled by scholars trying to say, well, this fits into the Christian idea of provenance. And a lot of other scholars saying, well, no, it's also a carryover of this idea of fate. And the truth is it, it does both. It's It's syncretism, it fits both. And if you believed in a sort of non-Christian idea of fate, then you could see, okay, that's what's happening here. And if you believed in the Christian idea of fate, or you could say, okay, that, or the, the if you believed in the Christian idea of providence, you could say, okay, that's that's what's happening here. Uh, but strangely, most of the, the passages that refer to God, if you didn't believe in the Christian God, but believed in another God like Odin or something, you could probably say, well, that's the God being referred to there. Remember that Odin is known by many names and a lot of them are really ambiguous uh, uh, references. But it does seem that the poet is trying to make this a Christian story, even though it doesn't always work very well. And so we run into this problem of overdetermination. Uh, I've mentioned this in the past in, in talking about the uh, the Greek and Roman gods and their role in, uh, especially in the Iliad and in the Aeneid. There will be a description of something like, you know, two people are fighting and one of them wins, but it's because of this god. Uh, there's a, a reference to uh, uh, someone shooting an arrow at Menelaus and it hits Menelaus, but it, it hits his buckle and so it doesn't kill him. He's just, you know, wounded uh, briefly. Uh, but in the, the Iliad, we're told that it's because Athena, you know, pushed the arrow so that it, uh, just, it hit his buckle uh, rather than killing him. Uh, you know, elsewhere, uh, Athena will guide someone's arm as they throw a, a javelin to, to hit an enemy. Uh, so we have the person throwing the javelin and we have Athena. Both of them are sort of apparently necessary causes uh, to this event happening. Uh, we have the buckle blocking the arrow, but we also have Athena blocking the arrow. Uh, well, this happens a lot in Beowulf. There's a lot of descriptions of God uh, taking part in the action, but he's taking part by having Beowulf take part. Uh, so over determination means, you know, we have uh, Beowulf doing something and God did it too. And curiously, this idea can be used to describe the way a king takes responsible for what his warriors do. So remember that in a chiefdom, uh, the king leads his army into battle. The army themselves, they, they beat the other army, they take their treasures, but then it's all that treasure goes to the king and the king redistributes that treasure among uh, the, uh, the his thanes, his warriors. Uh, and frequently we have references uh, that Beowulf makes that, uh, you know, when I do this, you will receive credit, whether he's talking to Hrothgar or to Hyjalak. Uh, when his uh, king's warriors do something, the king gets credit for that. And we have that sort of thing happening when uh, Hrothgar puts Beowulf in charge of Heorot, the night that he, they expect Grendel to come and attack. And we're told that uh, Kinningwildr, uh, the sort of king of wonder, king of glory, places Beowulf as the protector of, of Heorot. It's ambiguous whether this is a reference to the Christian idea of God or maybe even a reference to Hrothgar. Uh, your translation, if you're using the Longman cultural edition, uh, refers, uh, translates it as uh, God. Uh, God Almighty uh, places Beowulf as the protector of Heorot against Grendel. But uh, Kinningwolder could mean uh, the king of glory, and that would sound like God, or it could be the, the glory king, the, the king who has, has won glory, and that could be Hrothgar. Uh, a lot of other instances, like in line 623 to, to 28, uh, we're told that you know the Lord uh, lent them aid in their anguish, weaving their war luck. Uh, for one man alone had the might and main to fight off the fiend, to crush him in combat, proving who ruled the race's men then and forever, God Almighty. Uh, so what God is doing here is not directly intervening in order to defeat Grendel, he's sending Beowulf. So Beowulf does it and God does it. After that we're told God's wisdom and one man's courage changed that fate. And lines 1370 to 78, we have a description of uh, Grendel's mother uh, attacking Beowulf, knocking, knocking him on the ground, getting on top of him and stabbing him in the chest with her knife, but his mail shirt uh, de deflects the blow. And we're told that Waylon, the, the legendary smith, made it. And I'll talk more about him in a minute. But uh, we have this sort of ancient heirloom, the spectacular piece of armor uh, deflects this knife blow. That, that's exactly what armor's supposed to do. But yet uh, the, the narrator follows that by saying that, you know, God, uh, God did it. Uh, the, the armor did it and God did it. Everything that, that God does in the poem is something somebody else or something else does. So it's, you know, this natural, uh, obvious cause caused the effect, but God did it too. And these seem to be more interpolations. These seem to be more uh, 
uh, more of a need to take a, a secular story, a story that doesn't really have uh, anything about Christian providence in it, and add just enough of that to make it fit this sort of uh, you know test of religious faith. Uh, so that it can be justified, this text can be justified not as just a heroic story, the kind of thing that Alcuin uh, uh, condemned and said, don't don't waste your time with these stories, but to take it from that and make it into something with uh, just enough of a Christian message to justify reproducing it, retelling it, and writing it down. Now, one of the most interesting things that seems to be um, a point of syncretism is the idea of judgment, and the word for judgment here in, in, in Old English for the most part is dome, D-O-M. Uh, dome is where we get our modern English word doom, and that's usually because you know the doomsday, the day of dome, uh, which uh, a phrase which actually appears a couple times in Beowulf, is the day when God will you know separate the wheat from the chaff, separate the good from the evil, and say these go to hell and these go to heaven. Uh, that's the the day of judgment, uh, and we still sort of have you know use it with that connotation a lot of times today, but it also means glory. It also means the way people judge you after you. Uh, have done something great, and then after your your life is over, uh, how people remember you. Uh, there are, are two concepts here. One is is loaf, which is fame, like how how well known you are. But then there's also dome. Uh, so it's not just enough to be remembered. You want to be remembered well. You want the judgment on you to be good, whether it's by God at doomsday or by people who remember you and remember you well. Uh, so there's there's God's judgment that Beowulf refers to when he says uh, uh, in, in lines uh, 391 to 2, and then again in 978 and a few other places. Uh, this is usually Dritnes Dome, which means the Lord's uh, judgment. Uh, now, uh, I mentioned in a previous lecture that Dritten uh, or Dryden could be your Lord, like your king, the chief, somebody like Hrothgar or Hyjalak, or it could be God. Uh, it, it's very frequently ambiguous as to who this is referring to. Uh, there's a lot of reference to sin in uh, Beowulf. Uh, Grendel is described as the shepherd of sins. Uh, Beowulf is described as you know not wanting to die uh, in sin, uh, accusing Unferth of uh, of being guilty of sin. But the only sins that are referred to, there, there's really three, but one of them seems to be the, the main one: uh, being arrogant or being prideful. That could be uh, considered a sin, although we're going to see that. You know, wanting to achieve fame and, and glory, that's not a sin. Um, there's the reciprocal relationship between a, a king and a thane. A thane is supposed to be loyal to his king and fight bravely in battle and, and never abandon his king on the battlefield and all this, but the king then has to give uh, treasure to his thanes, never mistreat his thanes. And anybody, whether it's the king or the thane that fails this relationship, that is a problem. But the one thing that's really sort of described as a sin is killing a member of your own family. Uh, this is something that obviously Cain does. This seems to be why Cain is such an important figure, as, uh, as such an evil figure, uh, that his, his sin is so bad that his, uh, all of his descendants bear this mark of, of sin. Uh, they bear the mark of this kinslayer. Um, and that's the way he's described in line 97. Uh, but also when Beowulf meets Unferth, and Unferth uh, you know, insults Beowulf, he says, you were too prideful and you, you lost the swimming race to Brecca. Uh, Beowulf says, you know, I, I wouldn't be boasting of my bravery if the only people I'd ever kill, killed were my own kin. And that seems to be what Unferth has done. He seems to, uh, th this reference is that he's killed his own kin. Uh, and then after Beowulf is, is mortally wounded by the dragon, in, uh, starting in line uh, 2421, he says that, you know, I've done good, I've, I've won treasure for my people, you know, he got the the, the dragon's treasure hoard, and he wants to get, leave that to his people like a good ring giver, a good, uh, a good king is supposed to do. But he also says that, I rejoice, though sick with my death wound, that God may not blame me for baseless bloodshed or killing of kin when breath quits my body. So this is the main thing that he's looking at. He's not, he doesn't have our idea that you need to confess your sins and, and ask for forgiveness for your sins and all this. He's not asking for forgiveness. All he's saying is, I feel good that I'm about to die. The fact that I've never committed this one real sin. I haven't killed any of my own kin. I haven't killed anybody that didn't really have it coming, so I'm good. No need for praying for forgiveness or, or last rites or anything like that. So this is a very different version of sin than we might assume when we read that word. Uh, our modern schemata, and, and frankly, the, the the schema of sin in the Middle Ages uh, wasn't much different than ours. Uh, but that's not the one we see in Beowulf. 
Now, arrogance is considered sinful, overweening, over uh, thinking too much of yourself. And this is frequently used uh, in, in Old English. It's described by words like overheed, which is uh, like overthinking, not thinking too much, but thinking too much about yourself. Over mode, uh, having too much uh, pride, too much, usually being too pushy, being a bully, being someone who's uh, more of a, a threat to other people. Remember in Hroth Saga, the berserkers that serve King Rolf are kind of pushy. They even threaten King Rolf indirectly. They say, do you think you're man enough to fight with us? Something like this. Um, and then some of uh, Hroth's other retainers before Bodvar gets there, you know, they're abusive to people that are uh, weaker than them, people like uh, Hjalti. And that's the kind of overmode. That's the kind of, you know, mode can be uh, a word for bravery, but overmode is bad. Overheaged, you know, heaged is, is the name of one of the queens, the, uh, the queen of the Geats at one point. Um, that's good, having mind, having thoughtfulness is good, but overheaged is, is bad. And this is something that Unferth and, and Beowulf sort of contend with. Unferth keeps accusing Beowulf of being arrogant, um, but Beowulf says, you know, I, you know, this is all I did and I'm not bragging about it. Uh, he wants to dissociate himself from, from boasting. Now that's not to be confused with eagerness for glory. The very last lines of the poem uh, say that the Beowulf's men grieve for him, grieve for Beowulf. Great among kings, mildest in his mien, uh, most gentle of men, kindest to his kinfolk, and keenest for fame. And that last line, keenest for fame, the Old English word is lofgjornost. Uh, the word there uh, is, is lof, which means sort of uh, the kind of fame where you're known widely. Um, but frequently throughout the, the poem, he's also described as looking for dome, looking for judgment, not necessarily God's judgment, but the judgment of people after him. So remember, you want both. You want to be known widely, you don't want people to forget about you, so you want loaf, but then when they remember you, you want them to judge you uh, favorably and say, you know, you did right when you were alive. And so along that line, uh, you know, Hrothgar, when he's trying to motivate Beowulf to uh, to be strong against Grendel when he fights him, he says in 590, uh, be mindful of fame, make your might known. Uh, so fame here is good, you know, earn that fame, earn that judgment. And the word there is, is actually dome. And then when uh, Beowulf has uh, killed Grendel, but then Grendel's mother comes and kills Ashura, uh, Hrothgar's you know, closest lieutenant, uh, his closest thane, uh, Beowulf says, you know, do not be sorry, wise man, this is 1384, uh, do not be sorry, it's better for everyone that he avenge his friends rather than mourn for them too long. Each of us must expect an end to the life in this world. He who can should gain glory, and that's Dolmes, uh, before death. This is what is best for a warrior after his death. And that's the quotation I put up here on the uh, top left. Uh, Let he who can gain glory before death, that is best for a warrior after death. In other words, there is judgment at death and after death. That much sounds like it fits with Dritna's dome, with God's judgment. But in this case, it's people's judgment. It's the, the judgment of the people who remember you after your death. That is what you're left with after you're dead. And it's sort of, uh, one of these moments where it's clear that Beowulf isn't looking forward to life after death, like actually you know, going to heaven or something like that, but he's looking forward to being remembered well. He's looking forward to dome from the people who remember him, rather than God's judgment. And this should sound familiar. We've encountered this quite a bit. This is Kleos Amphiton uh, in, in the Iliad. Uh, but it's also the word used in the Havamal. I remember this the Old Norse uh, uh, collection of uh, sayings of aphorisms, which are uh, attributed to Odin, the you know Norse pagan god, uh, and Odin is supposed to have said, you know, cattle die, kinsmen die, you yourself will die, but I know th one thing that will never die: judgment on every man dead. And the word in the Old Norse there is domer, which is the the cognate of the Old English domus. So again, this is uh, not looking at sort of actually experiencing life after death. But it's enough that when everything you've built up is gone, when you, you know, the, the Ubisoot lament uh, recognizes that everything you achieve is gonna be gone, everything you build is gonna go away, you and everybody you know are gonna die, but there may be one consolation, that is if you've earned dome, if you've earned good judgment, uh, the judgment of people uh, after you're, you're dead, that is the one thing that survives you. It's not looking forward to an afterlife uh, in heaven or Valhalla or anything else like that, 
uh, passages like this seem to be focused on just being remembered, just being becoming a story that lives on after your physical body is gone. So a few other elements of, uh, of Old English poetry that we see happening in Beowulf. Old English poetry is known for what we call kinnings. And these are uh, figures of speech, sometimes they're metaphors, sometimes they're metonyms. Remember when you describe one thing, uh, a part of a thing to stand for the whole thing. Like if I said that uh, Hrothgar went to Frisia with uh, 50 swords. Well, that doesn't mean he just had 50 swords that he had to wield himself. He had 50 men carrying swords. That would be a metonym. So a kinning might be a metaphor, it might be a metonym uh, that refers to something indirectly and usually in some sort of compound word. So uh, one way of describing the sea, we have, we have these seafarers, they're describing the sea and they call it the whale road, Hronrada. And we actually have that on the, the first page of, of Beowulf. Um, when shield sheafing is, uh, you know, as a child put in a boat and sent over the whale road, uh, the Hronrad, the sea. Uh, swords are frequently described as battle lights, uh, Beodolema, uh, not, you know, something that uh, is metal, you know, it's described as if it was something that emitted light. So of course the metal would be reflecting light, but uh, the swords themselves are described as sort of giving off light. Uh, your body, and frequently, specifically your rib cage, is described as your bone locker, your bone locker. Uh, so if you, you pierce your enemy's bone locker, you know, that, that's actually pretty hard because the, you know, you have to get through the ribs uh, in order to do that. Um, the ships that sail over the, the Hronrad or the Sundwudu, the sea wood, uh, sometimes are referred to as, you know, stallions of the, the water or something like that. A poet is someone who unlocks his word hoard, as if like all the, the poetic diction, the, the vocabulary he has to describe this story, you know, in other words, his ability to give that story a narrative uh, comes from this treasury he has where the, the treasures inside are words and he's presumably got more than, you know, the average person. Uh, but sometimes somebody like Beowulf or the Wanderer will unlock his word hoard and, and speak in sort of poetic uh, or, or stately uh, manner. Uh, shield sheafing is described as the helm of shieldings, and Hrothgar or later uh, is called the helm of shieldings. So the king is the helmet that protects the people. Uh, he's he's not just sort of the head; he's also the protector. And these are words. This uh, this word horde of kinnings would be used by a shop. Now the modern English word is bard or poet. Uh, I'm going to distinguish between the word poet and a uh, shop. Or, or bard, because the poet might be somebody who actually composes the poem. The shop is gonna be someone who sings the, the poem, the way Benjamin Bagby did at the beginning of the, uh, the video. But sometimes the shop and the, the poet may be the same person, the, because the shop uh, could make uh, variations when he uh, sings. And we've seen this in uh, the, the text that we've read since at least Homer. Uh, there is a lot of room for uh, independent variation in any specific performance. Another characteristic of Anglo-Saxon poetry that I wish we had more of today is the technique of understatement. This is something you'll see not just in Old English uh, uh, poetry, but also Old Norse poetry, Old Norse prose. Uh, you'll see it uh, if you've read the uh, assigned uh, chapters from Greta's saga. But there is this tendency to, in a world where everything is dangerous and everything is extreme, uh, we live in a world of extreme uh, sunlight in the summertime and extreme darkness in the wintertime because it's you know so far north. Uh, it's a world of extreme cold, uh, especially in the wintertime. But uh, you know you get to Iceland and you're around volcanoes. There's extreme heat. It's a world of extremes, but the language doesn't reflect that. The language actually tries to understate everything, which is exactly the opposite of the way we do things today. Today, everything is awesome. And if you think about the word awesome, it literally means to be filled with awe. It's sort of this, you know, awe is this feeling of uh, how small you are in, in, in front of this giant uh, sort of uh, thing that changes your experience. Um, and it, it could also be terror. If we say something's awful, it's, you know, you, it fills you with, with awe, fills you with terror. Uh, or, you know, massive amount of respect or something like that. But now just, you know, somebody, you know, brought me a beer that I wasn't expecting. I'll say, oh, awesome. Uh, I'm filled with awe that I've got this one little trifling thing. Uh, and of course, we've, we've gone this far to say, you know, that, oh my God, I'm literally dying. I use the word literally just to mean like, well, kinda, you know, rather than being literally. Um, 
uh, these things are the greatest things that happen to you ever, or they're the worst things that happen to you ever, and then tomorrow you'll have another worst thing that ever that happens to you. Uh, we use hyperbole uh, all the time. Uh, we typically use these words that just exaggerate out of all proportion, and you know, people understand it, they get the joke, they get that it's not really awesome or terrible or, or literally anything. But it's exactly the opposite in these old Germanic uh, uh, languages, the old Germanic literature. Um, when Beowulf kills Grendel and hangs his arm up from the rafters in Heorot, uh, people come from all over the place to see it. And your translation, or the, the Longman translation, really, I don't, I don't like the, the way they uh, translated it, because they sort of lose that understatement. They say that uh, you know people were happy to see that, that Grendel was killed. But actually, what the, the Old English says is that uh, Grendel's departure from life did not seem mournful to any man. In other words, you know, people didn't grieve when Grendel was dead. You know, he didn't have the usual mourners at his funeral. Uh, that is a major understatement. This is a monster that's been ripping people apart for, for years uh, that nobody's been able to do anything about until now. Finally, he's dead, so it's not just relief. In, in, in it. Of course, it is joy, but the, the poet just sort of understates it by saying there were few people who mourned uh, his passing. Uh, later, when Rothgar is talking about the, uh, the mirror, the swamp where uh, Grendel and his mother lived, uh, it's this terrible place. It's got these you know, serpents and monsters in the water. Uh, and he says that when a deer, the, the heath striding heart, you know, H-A-R-T is a, a male deer, when the heart, the deer, is hunted by hounds, this strong antlered stag is seeking a thicket. It's trying to hide, it's trying to get away from these hound, these hunting dogs that are uh, attacking it. And it runs for cover, but it would rather be killed at bay on the bank before hiding its head in that water. In other words, the, the stag would rather be ripped apart by dogs. It's just gonna give up running if the only direction it can run is into Grindel's mirror, into Grindel's swamp. And he follows that, you, you get how terrible a place this is that Beowulf's about to have to go into. It's, it's so bad that a deer would rather be torn apart than go into it. And then he follows that by saying, it is no peaceful place. Well, that's a bit of an understatement. After this long description about how terrible a place it is, he just says, it, it's not a, not a happy place, not a peaceful place. Um, I'm gonna see a lot more of that uh, if, you, if you look further into Old English and Old Norse literature. Like when you read the Iliad and the Odyssey, you probably came across a lot of references to people that you didn't recognize and you probably wondered, do I need to know who this person is? Uh, do I need to know what, what's happening here? Do I need to know who Heromod is? Do I need to know who Sigmund is? Do I need to know who Ermanric is? Do I need to know what happens to Heorot uh, uh, later? Because we're told that you know, that was before the timbers of Heorot had burned. Uh, and you're probably thinking, is, is that something that's gonna happen later uh, in, the, in the poem? Um, these are digressions. Uh, these are sort of descriptions that are off topic for the immediate narrative, but they're things that the audience of the poem would have recognized. The poet would have assumed that his uh, uh, hearer, you know, when it was an oral tradition, and then uh, reader, uh, presumably once it was written down, would assume that the reader knew who these people were and knew why these were important things. And so, uh, you know, I might say that, you know, this was before Luke Skywalker found out that Darth Vader was his father. Well, uh, presumably you already know that Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. Uh, but I might be telling you a part of the story and it's important that you know that this is before that happens. This is why we have some of these references to, you know, this is why uh, Heorot, uh, or this is when Heorot was still standing. He presumes you know that Heorot would later be destroyed. So it's a digression, it goes off topic, and it's an allusion if it's a reference to another story that you're uh, supposed to know. So one of the, the references here, I mentioned already the, the coat of mail that uh, Beowulf is wearing uh, that uh, preserves him when Grendel's mother stabs him with her knife. Uh, we're told that Waylon made it, and he uh, makes another couple of objects and described in Beowulf. Uh, the, the poet expects that you know that uh, Wayland is a smith. Uh, he's this sort of legendary smith that's made some of these legendary weapons and armor. Uh, he's got his own sort of cycle of legends about him. A few of them uh, still come down to us. Uh, if you read the Old English poem Deor, uh, you hear a little bit about Wayland. that uh, you know, he knows a, a lot about sorrow because he's suffered uh, long hardship, sorrow, longing for his companions, ice cold exile. Uh, he often found woes after Nithod put compulsion on him, a supple bounds of sinew on a better man. Uh, so this, this king, Nithod, uh, uh, captured Waylon and tried to force him to make these, uh, these treasures for him. And he actually hamstrung him. He cut the hamstrings in the back of his legs so that he was lame. 
Um, but uh, he eventually uh, steals this sort of magical uh, swan cloak that allows him to uh, you know, fly. And uh, he, he gets revenge on Nithod later on. But uh, these things are just very obliquely referred to in poems like Deor and in Beowulf. But uh, they add significance to those poems because in the case of Deor, uh, Deor is saying, well, people have been through worse things than I've been through. They got over it, so I'll, I'll get over it too. Uh, and in Beowulf, it's just important to know that these, uh, 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 this armor that Beowulf has is really, really uh, sort of legendary armor. Uh, so this is something that no ordinary person would have, and clearly he's using it for a very legendary purpose. Um, I'll just, uh, you know, this is a, a picture of the, the Frank's casket, uh, this uh, box that has these runes and images on it. Uh, and the, the picture uh, on the, the top right, the the left half of that picture uh, shows uh, Wayland in his uh, smithy uh, with his tools around him uh, making treasures and then it shows him uh, uh, capturing that swan cloak uh, immediately after that. Uh, these are parts of the, the larger uh, fabric of, of, of stories that are woven together in a narrative like Beowulf. You probably notice a lot of the same sort of ethos uh, from uh, Hroth's saga uh, that determined how a, a warrior was supposed to be, how a king was supposed to be. Uh, you know, that uh, is characteristic of the chiefdoms of the time of the Great Migrations. Not so much by the time Beowulf is written. The, when the poem of Beowulf is written, we are in a time of nation states. Uh, you know, uh, England has been uh, sort of unified after the Battle of Brunaber. Uh, we, we have something more like uh, what we think of a king ruling over a nation uh, now, where you're born into that nation, that's where your citizenship is, that's where your loyalty lies. Uh, my country right or wrong, or whatever. But before that, we had these chiefdoms where there was a lot of fish and infusion. You could leave if your uh, chieftain wasn't you know, treating you right. If you were uh, fighting hard for your chief and he wasn't rewarding you, you could, you could pick up and leave. Um, uh, if you were a noble, you know, if you had the, the means to do that. But that meant that the chief needed to be generous, uh, needed to give arm rings. These, uh, you know, this is the way you carried your wealth around with you. You couldn't go deposit your payment in the bank. Uh, you know, most of the time, you ha whatever you had was what you carried with you wherever you went. So if you want to carry gold around, you can put it in a bag and it'll just be this like thing hanging on your belt. But the easiest way to carry it is through one of these arm rings. You just put on your arm and there it is. And not only is that easier to carry, but you can also show somebody, here's how important I am. Here's how many battles I've fought in. Here's how much reward I've gotten from my king. So if you're gonna be that king, you have to be sure that this uh, uh, economic system keeps moving, that you're, you can keep redistributing wealth. That means you keep uh, conquering new territories or defeating other kings, uh, but getting new treasure, giving that treasure in turn back to your warriors. And so that they'll protect you uh, and this is another sort of strategy of the Hall of Heorot. Uh, it was uh, you know, described as this, this greatest of all halls, the most famous of all uh, uh, mead halls of this time. It's the same thing, the same place being described as Lidar in uh, Hroth's saga. Uh, this is something that would draw in some of the best warriors. And we really see this in Hroth's saga because it draws you know, Svipdair and it draws Bodvar and uh, the, these other champions to come to that place because that's where uh, you know, they'd rather serve that king rather than be kings themselves. That's a very important thing for a thane. Um, remember, Bodvar could have been king when his grandfather Ring, uh, after he killed Fiat, the, the lap sorceress, his grandfather Ring said, stay here and, and become king. He said, no, I'm not going to. Then he goes to the land of the Goths, or the Geats, and where his brother, uh, Thorir Houndsfoot, is, is king, and Thorir says, I'll, I'll make you a co-ruler with me and I'll give you all this treasure, and Bodvar says, no, I don't want to do that. What he wants to do is go to Hlidar and be one of Rolf's champions rather than be a chief uh, himself. Uh, something very similar with Beowulf, uh, after he defeats Grendel and Grendel's mother, it, it, uh, Hrothgar almost basically offers him uh, the, the throne. He says, you know, you would make a good king and a good protector of the shieldings, of the Danes. Uh, and Beowulf says, no, that's, you know, uh, I'm not gonna accept that. I'm going to go back to my king, Hyjalak, uh, in Geatland. Uh, after Hyjalak dies in that raid in Frisia, uh, he's got two sons and, and Beowulf could push them out of the way, but he chooses not to, even though he's, uh, the Hyjalak's sons are very young. Uh, Beowulf refuses to uh, displace them um, until they've uh, also been killed. And only then, when there's nobody else to take over, that's when he becomes king and rules for 50 years. So you want a thane who could be king, who's, who's that good, who's that great a warrior, but also that 
uh, intelligent, diplomatic, uh, strategic. Uh, you want that kind of person to be your thing, but you don't want them to actually uh, uh, take over uh, to, to displace you. And this is also why Beowulf is a bit of a threat. Uh, when he first comes to uh, Hailrot, it's uh, very clear th there that he's more powerful there, especially after he beats Grendel, than, than Hrothgar is. So Beowulf has to uh, overtly show humility before Hrothgar. And Hrothgar, you know, is full of reminders that please be, be humble, don't be like these bad guys. Uh, specifically, Hrothgar tells Beowulf, don't be like Haramod. This, uh, this ancient king who uh, was abusive to his thanes and was stingy and he would inflict uh, uh, violence on people uh, when he was in a, in a bad mood. And he's remembered, his dome is, is negative. He's remembered badly. Don't be like him. Don't, uh, don't be an, uh, a bad uh, ruler, a bad chief. Um, and also we see what it means to be a thane, uh, not just the way Beowulf acts uh, among uh, his uh, uh, to Hyjalak and to Hrothgar, but also when Beowulf is a king and he goes into battle against this dragon, remember he goes into battle against the dragon because he's trying to get this treasure hoard for his people. He's trying to defend the people from the dragon, but also uh, he wants that treasure hoard to give to his people. He wants to be the ring giver. He wants to have wealth to distribute to his people in addition to protecting them. And uh, when he goes to fight that dragon, his thanes abandon him. Uh, they seem to be uh, accustomed to, well, he's the one that does all the fighting, I'm just gonna let him do that. But he, the one thing that is loyal to him, Wiglaf or Wiglaf, uh, chastises them and says that, you know, it's because you abandoned your king and now he's dead, now we're gonna be overtaken. Everybody's gonna hear that Beowulf is dead, they're going to come attack us and we're all gonna die because uh, you guys abandoned your, your king, your chief, uh, at the moment that he needed you to repay all of these arm rings, to repay this treasure, all the weapons that he gave you. Uh, he gave you those weapons in order that, so that you would stand by him in this moment of need. This was that time, you did not stand by him, so now our whole kingdom falls apart. Uh, we have those sort of grim lines in, in Wiglaf's speech toward the end of Beowulf. Uh, it's not just that uh, now that Beowulf, our protector, is, is dead, we're, we're in danger, but not only is our protector dead, but our, the, the center that held us all together uh, is, is gone. And this fission, this sort of breaking apart is, has weakened us to the point where uh, the Geats are uh, not gonna be around anymore. And of course, uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, Geatland is in modern day Sweden uh, rather than in modern day Geatland because there's no more Geats. And it seems clear that uh, by the time Beowulf was uh, composed, it seems that the Geats uh, no longer existed as a people, especially not as a nation state. They would never make it from chiefdom to nation state the way Sweden and Norway and Denmark would. It might seem like there's not a lot for women to do in Beowulf uh, in, in this sort of you know, Thane-King relationship. Uh, and there's, we, we don't have powerful female figures represented in Beowulf the way we do uh, to some extent in, in Hroth Kraki's saga, where we have you know, the, uh, the sorceress uh, uh, Fit or White, uh, the, the, the lap uh, princess, uh, but also Queen Skuld, uh, the half-sister of uh, Hrolf Kraki, uh, who is descended from elves, and she's someone who can raise the dead, and uh, you know she's the only one, it seems, who could put together this army that could uh, defeat Hrolf Kraki. We don't have women quite uh, that prominent in the narrative of Beowulf, but in the background, we do have three examples of women who are doing something that is every bit as essential to this society as this uh, exchange between uh, thanes and kings, uh, this sort of ring giving and fighting on the battlefield that, that takes up most of the narrative. Uh, you need somebody who's gonna do the opposite of fighting, that is you need somebody who's going to keep, uh, keep allies together, uh, help uh, kingdoms make allies with other kingdoms, somebody who can be diplomatic, so one of my uh, mentors, my uh, thesis advisor when I was getting my uh, master's degree, uh, Alexandra Olson, has written a lot about the roles of women in uh, Anglo-Saxon and, and Old Norse uh, uh, literature. And she lays out these five roles that are, are easy to overlook, in, uh, especially in a narrative that's focused on martial conflict, you know, uh, fighting and, uh, and that sort of thing. But the role, uh, first of all, of cupbearer. This is something we see in the art a lot. Uh, this uh, pendant here in the, the bottom of the screen uh, shows a woman carrying and holding out a cup. 
uh, in the top right, this is from a runestone that depicts Odin riding on his eight-legged horse, uh, Sleipnir. And there's a, a Valkyrie walking out and holding up a mead horn uh, for him. Uh, this is a very important role that we know a little bit about, but only a little bit. It seems to be more than just uh, a sort of a serving uh, role. She's not just a, a waitress. Uh, this is someone who has to maintain this peace when you have a hall full of warriors, a hall full of egos contending with each other. She's someone who, to whom this place belongs. Uh, so if you go into this mead hall, uh, it is as much um, uh, Waltheo's uh, hall as it is Hrothgar's. It is as much Hig's hall as it is Hyjalak's. Uh, and she's the one that sort of determines uh, who drinks, what order, uh, where they sit, uh, things like this. And uh, uh, that way, if you let uh, the woman decide, then it won't be an issue of men fighting over who gets to drink first and who gets to sit where. Connected to this is this role of, of a peace weaver, uh, someone who can figure out how to get these, you know, egotistical males to listen to each other long enough to uh, not kill each other and maybe even coordinate their, their efforts. Uh, and, and this is maybe the most important role, but I'm gonna come back to it. There's the role of the mourner. This is someone who uh, remembers uh, the, the people from earlier in her life precisely because the women are going to live longer than the men. In a world like this, uh, the mortality rate where you know every man's sort of dome judgment is determined by uh, how good he is in battle, uh, well, he's not gonna be that, that great forever. Uh, so the, the men probably aren't gonna live as long as the women. The women are the ones who are gonna remember uh, the way things were in the past, remember the people who have died, uh, but also the customs of the past and the stories of the past. Uh, frequently, the, the woman will play a role of, as instigator. We have this happen with uh, the uh, sort of contrast or the foil to the, the Queen Heed uh, on uh, lines uh, 1705. We have uh, Heed, the queen of the, uh, the Hyjalax queen, the queen of the Geats, as a, a sort of good queen, a good uh, peace weaver and cupbearer, and uh, opposed to her is this other queen, Modthrith, Who's, uh, uh, who's sort of an instigator. Uh, so starting on line 1705, we hear that uh, a queenly Heed, uh, Hyrith's daughter, dwelt there as well, wise and refined, though her winters were few. Uh, she housed in the stronghold. In other words, she's really young, but she's very smart. This is why she's known as Heed, which literally means thought. Open-handed, she granted generous gifts to the Geats. Uh, most unlike Modthrith, a maid so fierce that none but her father dared venture near. The brave man who gazed at Maldrith by day might reckon a death rope already twisted. In other words, he's gonna be hung for something uh, because she's been annoyed by him. Uh, he might count himself quickly captured and killed, a stroke of a sword prescribed for his trespass. In other words, she has told someone else, she has incited uh, someone else to fight him and kill him. Such is no style for a queen to proclaim. Though peerless, a woman ought to weave peace, not snatch away life for illusory slights. So what, uh, a queen has the power to provoke fights, uh, to provoke, to, to instigate uh, you know, her will by getting someone else to do it. But she also has the power to be a peace weaver. Uh, we see uh, Waltheo, the wife of Hrothgar, uh, acting in these roles as a peace weaver, and she does it also in, in the role of a counselor, especially in, around lines 1023 to 86, where she basically, tells Hrothgar in front of all these other people, she gives him advice, but she does it in a way that's very subtle, that's uh, the, the sort of designed to make sure everybody there is, is friendly toward each other. Uh, she speaks to Hrothgar about Hrothulf, who remember is Rolf Kraki, who is uh, Hrothgar's nephew. Uh, she's also there with her own sons, uh, Hrethric and Rothman, and they are sitting with uh, uh, on either side of Beowulf. So Beowulf is there, he's just, uh, accomplished what Hrothgar and no other uh, Dane could. So he's a very powerful presence in the hall right now. Hrothulf, for reasons we'll get to in a minute, is also a very powerful presence in the hall right now. They're both potentially threatening presences to her sons, Hrethric and Rothman, because Hrethric and Rothman are the ones who were supposed to inherit uh, the, the kingdom after Hrothgar. And so Walthael has to decide how to get uh, this potential conqueror, this uh, person in Beowulf who is now more powerful than anybody there, who has saved them from Grendel, but yet uh, now seems to be 
uh, you know, have the potential to at least sort of step in and take over in Herod on his own. Uh, we also have Rothulf, who uh, is is older than the sons of Hrothgar, and you know his father was queen or his father was king before uh, Hrothgar was, so he has the potential to step in and, and take over the kingdom. So Waltheo is trying to make sure that everybody that's that's friendly toward each other right then remains friendly toward each other, especially in the in the case that uh, Hrothgar might not uh, live as long as is Hrothulf. And in doing this, this role of peace weaver resembles the role of, uh, you know, using this term weaver might seem sort of uh, sexist. It's like, oh, the woman's role is to, you know, weave textiles. And that, and that was something that women had spent a lot of time doing because you can't just go to the store and buy these things. Uh, everything you wear has to be woven by somebody, probably somebody close by. And it's uh, something that all women were, uh, were, were trained to do. And this was the case uh, in, the ancient Greek society of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, we see, you know, Penelope weaving the shroud for Laertes, the, the, the father of Odysseus, and it's like only she can do it. Uh, women spend a lot of time weaving, but uh, in this, it's not just sort of a, a very basic menial chore. It connects them to the fates, the Norns, uh, these supernatural women who literally wove the destinies of people. So every thread, uh, you know, a, your lifetime is this linear thread, but it, it's not just off on its own. It's it's interwoven with these uh, the threads, the life uh, lifetimes of other people. Uh, and you have to sort of put them together in this really complicated fabric. Uh, uh, the, the way a weaver would. So uh, this idea of a weaver of peace, this is somebody who has a lot of loose ends to deal with. Uh, and these guys, you know, with these, especially the hot-headed sort of self-interested guys trying to, you know, win glory in the world and win treasure uh, are going to just, you know, are, are going to be a consistent threat to each other and to the, the peace of the world around them. So they're all loose ends that these peace weavers have to um, successfully weave together. And this brings us to Freyawaru, who is the daughter of Hrothgar and Walthea. We're, we're introduced to her around line 1786, and her story is going to be uh, important, not in the narrative, but uh, as a sort of way for us to look at the social intelligence of this time period, and the social intelligence of Beowulf and, and this type of literature. 